Omobola Johnson is senior partner of TL Home Capital, a venture capital firm with recent focus on deal flow generation, investment and value generation in technology companies in sub-Saharan. Before joining TL Com, Omobola was Minister of Communication Technology Nigeria from 2011 to 2015, focusing on the launch and execution of the National Broadband Plan and the support of the Nigerian technology industry, including the pioneering involvement of the government in a local VC fund and a network of startup incubators. Prior to in the Nigerian government, she had gained over 25 years of consulting experience with Accenture, including five years as country managing director, working with companies in a variety of industries transforming them into more competitive and dynamic organizations. Omobola serves on the board of a number of leading Nigerian and multinational corporations. She also serves on the board of the World Wide Web Foundation and is the founding chairperson and trustee of the Women in, Bu in Management and Business, WIMBIS. Omobola has a bachelor's in electrical and electronic engineering from the University of Manchester. She has a master's in digital electronics from King's College London and a doctorate in business administration from the School of Management of Cranfield University. She is the recipient of the Distinguished Alumna Award from Cranfield University and the Lagos Business School. I also have to add that she's also been one of our long-term facilitators from Faith's inception too. So she's definitely not a stranger to Faith. Please, can everyone in the room stand up and join me in giving a rousing, warm Faith Foundation welcome to Dr. Omobala Johnson. Thank you very much, Nike, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or maybe I should say uh, entrepreneurs. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As Nike said, I was... Um, I used to do some facilitation for Faith Foundation, but that was many, many years ago. And I think the organization has grown in leaps and bounds since the time that I was last here. Uh, so congratulations and uh, well done to all of you for taking that brave, bold step to being an entrepreneur in what is actually a very tough uh, business environment. So today I've been asked to speak to you. I know the whole um, uh, meeting today, conference today is about scale and how do you innovate for scale, how do you build uh, large businesses and what I'm going to try and do, I know I've been asked to speak from a technology perspective but I think that it goes beyond technology so if you permit me I'll talk a little bit more than just how you can use technology to, to scale. And I, I want to start with um, some numbers. So according to uh, Smeden, Small and Medium Enterprise Development Agency and the MBS, there are about 37 million SMEs in Nigeria and you can imagine that this looks like there's one SME for almost uh, every six people or something like that. And you see that as you drive along the street, there are businesses everywhere that, that you look. But what is more interesting is that out of that 37 million, that 36.9 million are actually um, micro enterprises. And these are businesses that employ between one to nine people. And only 68,000 are small enterprises and 4,500 are medium enterprises. I think what would have been more interesting is if they could tell us how many micro businesses, how many of those 37 million businesses move from micro to small and how many move from small to medium? So how do you cross between employing 10 people to employing 20 people to employing 100 people? And I suspect that the answer is probably not that many, which is why you have this stubbornly high figure of micro businesses in, uh, in Nigeria. And so you could conclude quite easily that either, you know, we don't... Um, Businesses in Nigeria lack the capacity or the wherewithal to, to scale. Despite the fact that Nigeria is a large country, 200 million uh, consumers, uh, with a large population who are in need of products and services. And so the most vivid example of this that I see is in the last three or four years where there's been um, a lot of focus by both the Buhari administration and the Jonathan administration on entrepreneurship and, and starting businesses. And with this, you've seen the advent of a number of these made in Nigeria affairs, where people come, different industries, fashion, leather, beauty, whatever it is, they come and they showcase young Nigerians that are building businesses. And I always love the energy in the room, the creativity, the innovation, all that goes on in the room. But I always be very saddened because I know for sure that most of the businesses 
in that room or in that hall or in that arena will never scale beyond what they have uh, done in, in, in that. Most of them will never scale. And there are a number of reasons for this. And sometimes most of them, not only will they never scale, they will not be in existence for an, in, in the next 12 months. And I think there are three reasons for this. Number one is the idea behind the business itself. It may not be one that can actually survive more than 12 or 24 months because the idea or the market value proposition wasn't robust enough. The second reason is that is the entrepreneur's focus, their vision, their aspiration, how ambitious they are in trying to build that business. And the third is really something that was already talked about on this panel uh, earlier on, the structure, the operations, and the governance of the business. All of these things contribute to businesses that can, that, that can scale. But before I go on to talk about this, I want to also say that you know, not every business wants to scale or needs to scale. And I take the example of the, of the car industry, where you can have very high margin businesses that are for only very select people. If you look at the car industry, um, you have a company like Ferrari that makes only 8,000 cars uh, a year. Uh, there are only 25,000 Lamborghinis in the whole world, only 25,000. So these are very expensive cars, very select uh, clientele. Um, but then you also, and the average cost of a Lamborghini is probably running into almost a million dollars. But then you have a Toyota in contrast, and Toyota today churns out about 10 million cars a year. So there are industries where you have scale deliberately and you don't have scale deliberately. But, you know, I believe that most of the entrepreneurs in this room, in an emerging market with a black population, large country, want to be the Toyotas of their industry and not the Lamborghinis or the, um, or the Ferrari. So the topic I was given today is, uh, it was innovating for scale through digital and technological transformation. Nikki, I didn't really understand what that meant. And so <laughs> it was very big English. So I gave it my own topic, and I've, I've, I've taken the liberty to do that. And so the new topic of this keynote is, how can I make my business big, make a lot of money, and please, how can technology help me to do that? So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Thank you. A simple English. <laughs> but it implied in this newly crafted topic is the construct of innovation, because I think that's key in everything that's been done over, the, over today. And you know, there's a school of thought that says that you must keep innovating in business or you will die. You know, this innovate or die. If you don't innovate and think through it creatively, your business is not going to succeed. So I'm going to structure my keynote around four lines of questions. The first is, is my business an innovative business? Or what exactly is the innovation in my business? The second is, can my innovation, can the innovation in my business scale? Can the innovation in my business make my business big? The third is, can my company scale? And there's a difference between can my innovation scale or can my company scale? Because you can answer yes to question two, that my innovation, what I thought about, can scale. But the answer to question three, can my company scale, could be no. And we'll talk about the reasons why that, that could be a no. And the fourth question we're going to examine is, what is the role of technology in helping my company to grow big and to be profitable? So those are the four questions that I'm going to try and, uh, I'm going to walk with you. You're going to answer that for your businesses, and I'm going to walk you through that. So number one, innovation. I have a doctoral degree in, uh, a, a doc, doctor in business administration from Cranford University, as was said in, my, um, in the introduction. And my thesis was based around research of what CEOs in Nigeria did to make them successful. Because I had this underlying thesis that CEOs in emerging markets just face a lot more tougher challenges than CEOs in developed markets. And so there are things that we must do differently from other CEOs that will make us succeed. And in my research, I discovered that there were 18 practices that CEOs in Nigeria um, had to, ha practices that they had to do, things that they had to do almost on a daily basis for them to be successful. I'm not going to bore you with the 18 of them, but the one that came out in, in my interviews with the various CEOs in Nigeria was the, was the practice of innovation. And the way that they described this innovation was in three ways, and I'll just read them out to you quickly. It's innovation for them was a means of meeting the unmet needs and demands of the customer base in a unique and creative way, a means of delivering competitive advantage to the company, a means of responding to the specific context of an emerging economy that is the low purchasing power of the majority of consumers. So if we take these definitions as reasonable definitions of innovation from people that are actually in Nigeria running businesses and successful businesses in Nigeria, I want you to examine your business now, the entrepreneurs in the room, and think through which kind of innovation is your business engaged in. 
Do your products and services address the low purchasing power of the majority of Nigerians? And just to give you a statistic that I recently got from Reach Technologies, it says that only 4% of people that live in Lagos earn over 500K a month. The majority earn less than 60K a month. So think about the single-use packs that the FMCGs have now started. You know, it was really to address that low um, purchasing power. Does your product or service address an unmet demand? And I'll give you an example of a product or service that, meets that, that addresses an unmet demand. Um, there's a company called Reliance HMO. Some of you may have heard about it. And the thesis of that company is based on the fact that many Nigerians want health insurance. But many Nigerians cannot fork out you know, 20,000, whatever it is, to pay for health insurance, the annual premium that is required. You can't put that out of your pocket in one go. And the innovation of, of uh, Reliance HMO is that they will allow you to pay your, monthly insur your, to pay your insurance premiums on a monthly basis, but you get cover the minute you pay your 3,500 or 2,000 naira. That's an innovation. So it means that I can now afford a 30,000 naira premium because I don't have to pay all of, all of it on day one. I can pay it bit by bit. And with many other companies, you could pay the 12 months in bits, but you don't get any cover until you finish paying the 12 months. But they say, pay the first month, you get cover, and every month you pay your cover uh, increases. That's looking at an unmet demand and coming at it from an innovative perspective. How does your product or service deliver a competitive advantage to you as a business? Is it more affordable than the competitions? Is it better value than money? Does it come from an exceptional customer or after sales service? Or is it more available or more, or more accessible than the competition? So those are all the kind of things that you need to think about. So think about it around your business. So is your business uh, innovative? So if you're not able to answer any one of these questions in a positive manner, the one around innovation, you know, are you low purchasing power, an unmet demand, um, uh, competitive advantage. If you're not able to answer any one of these questions in a positive manner, you may want to leave the room now. Because if you can't, then I can tell you for nothing that everything else we say will not make any sense to you because your company, will not, your company cannot scale. So hopefully everybody in this room will stay because you have some kind of innovation, no matter how small, some kind of innovation in your, in your business. So let's go to question two, assuming that we all have some innovation in our business. Uh, question two says, can your innovation scale? So it's one thing to have innovation, it's another thing that it can actually deliver to you as an entrepreneur, a big company. And three things you will consider when you talk about scalable innovation. It's the size of your addressable market, and I'll talk about the addressable market in a minute. How people access your products and services, and the availability of your product or your service. So as a venture capitalist, I see many, um, I have many pitches. I send, get sent many pitches. And of course, the first thing that you do in a pitch is that you talk about your addressable market. And the first thing to say here is that, you know, your addressable market is not the population of Nigeria. So you can start with, oh, Nigeria is a country of uh, 200 million people, blah, blah, blah. That's fine, but that is not, it could be on Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram. Choose whatever poison you want to have. But make sure you have that online presence that they basically propagates or propels you from being a physical location to, that, um, to an online location where more people can, can see you. But your online presence is also quite important. It's got to be interesting, because remember there are thousands of millions of websites. Interesting, it's got to be fun, it's got to be interactive. Make sure it's always updated. And as I was drafting this keynote speech, I actually, we get a lot of pitches, unsolicited pitches um, online. They just send, go to our website and they put in the details. You know, this is what my company does, this is how much I'm looking for, and uh, these are my details. And every one of them has a website. And I just picked three at random. And I said, let me even go to the website of these companies. And without exception, all those websites it was, um, what was it called? Um, address not found. Proxy server not available. None of those websites were actually working. So it's not just about the first time you start a business, you do this website and you just forget about it. You've got to make sure the website is updated, it's up and running every single day because there's no point in that uh, on online presence. And you know, when you have this, you, know, you also see the website. It has, you know, contact us, info at something, you know, inquiries at something. You send an email to that info at something and you never get a response because nobody within the organization has a responsibility to make sure that if I make an inquiry, I get a, I get a response. Or sometimes you get an automated response and you never get anything back out of that automated response. So the point I'm making is that your online presence is not static. You've got to actually manage that online presence um, as, as well. You need to engage with data marketing, and you know, I'm talking about tech a little bit here, some of the tech companies we've invested in. 
There's a company called Terragon. And what they do is that they help companies to be more targeted in their online presence. So without getting too technical, they aggregate data from phone records, internet activity, online, offline, and they use that data to predictively score whether the people that you're targeting will be interested in your product. So assume that you have 17,500 people that may be interested in your product. When they gather, so you can say to them, you know, I'm looking for women that earn 500K or more uh, who live in Lagos and who work in particular, you know, areas of Lagos. They can look at all their records, sift through the, um, you know, sift through their database and come up with a list, uh, a list of people that might be interested in your product. And then they send either an SMS or a message to those people because it's very targeted. And the ones that respond are the ones that you probably want to just go a little bit further with and engage them to actually buy your product. So they score through millions and millions and millions of records, something that you can't do in an offline environment. So use these companies, Terragon, that's one company, but then other marketing technology companies, that's what, they, that's what they're called, marketing technology companies that will help you sift through a lot of data to make your marketing very, very focused to the people that are likely to buy your, your product. So you have an online presence. So how about allowing companies to actually transact business with you online? Um, with the advent of e-commerce platforms, the juniors of this world, payment gateways, Interswitch, Paystack, um, uh, uh, Flutterwave, it's not difficult or expensive for a business to start being online from day one. Because you don't, ha you don't have to build any of these things. They're all platforms that are available. You don't have to build a payment gateway. You don't have to build your own uh, e-commerce platform. You can just basically be on these platforms or have your, have your customers have access to them. And then you're online from day one. So you don't have to do any of these yourself. So standardizing your products and the pricing so that it's easy to just pick and click and, and pay. It's true that Nigerians are not you know, that comfortable transacting online. We're still a bit skeptical, not, not the way it is in developed economies. So the, work, the way that we behave is that we like to browse online, we we'll browse and we look at everything, and then we leave our homes, and then we go to the shop, and we actually look at it, touch it, feel it, and then we buy. And that's the behavior. You can't change that behavior. It's changing, but you, know, you can't change that behavior overnight. And so one of the things you have to think about, and this comes to the adaptability of your business, you, could, you should be able to integrate both your online and your offline presence. So for instance, you know, if customers come, make your browsing experience an enjoyable one. They see what you're doing, they see your services, they see your products, and when they come to your shop, you should be able to tell that this person has actually browsed my, uh, my website, and when they come into the store, you actually know and you can actually begin to interest them and engage them. So it's trying to integrate that offline presence and that online presence, because it's adapting your business to how the customer or the consumer um, behaves. And even when they're in your physical store, because you know, the, the, be the beauty of being online is that in a physical store, assuming that you can't afford somewhere as large as this, you can't showcase all your products or your, all your services, not all your stuff can be in there. So when they come to your physical store, you can also encourage them to go online and say, look, we've got more to show you. If you go online, you see all this. So that's all about integrating both your online presence and your, and your offline presence. Let me just make a quick digression here to caution those of you, particularly women, I think, um, that think that Instagram and Facebook, once you're on Instagram and Facebook, that is your sales channel. Am I running Okay, that is, your, um, that is your channel. It can only get you so far. Let me just give you an, an example. So you need to buy, someone that I actually went through, I needed to buy a fascinator for a wedding. And somebody told me that, oh, there's this lady on Instagram, she does these fantastic fascinators, and I go onto Instagram, and I saw, you know, very nice fascinators, but they didn't have the color that I wanted. So I got off Instagram, I called the lady, she could make it in that color that I wanted, she gave me her account details. I got off the phone, got onto my uh, mobile banking app, paid her, sent her a WhatsApp message that I paid you, and then you know, the fascinator was delivered to my house. Now, it all sounds very nice, but if you think about it, I've used about three different channels for that one transaction. You know, it was Instagram, it was telephone, it was WhatsApp, it was my mobile bank. So I'm coming in and out of your you know, online presence. And at any point in time, I could actually just terminate that transaction because I just can't be bothered. You know, I can't be bothered to do my online banking. I can't be bothered to get back to you. So the point I'm making is that, you know, a business model that requires phone call, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is, to make one transaction is not one that can scale. Because you need an army of staff to be able to do that, to do that for you. So you can think about different models. If, I, if I'm on my, your Instagram page, I can click on a link. The link takes me to a payment channel. I can pay through that link and you get the money and you deliver. So just think about, so being on Instagram is not enough. It's good for awareness, 
for sure, because you get a lot more eyes and eyeballs on your, on your products and services, but it's not a good way to scale and it's not a good way to basically use your online, online presence. So I hope you're getting the message about how to scale a business that is not, you know, um, it's not only about technology, but it's about innovation, it's about scalable innovations. And let's look at the third question. It's around, you know, is your company scalable? And, you know, again, it was spoken about earlier, so I'm not going to say too much about it. And it, it's really is around a number of questions. Internal systems, processes, structures that can manage scale. When you're doing 10 transactions a day, you can do it manually. When you're doing 100, you can do it manually. When you're doing 1,000, you cannot do it manually. So, you know, are your processes standardized? Are they documented? Is there technology? Are, can you do things from, day, from when, you, you, when you start a transaction to when you end a transaction? Can it all be online without any manual interventions? Um, how robust are your financial and accounting processes? Again, that was mentioned earlier. Um, are you accounting for all the costs and all the revenues in your business? Because that's, that's a big um, problem for, for SMEs. You think you're making money, but you're not accounting for all the costs in the business. But if you have a good accounting system, you can actually do that. Do you have an annual budget? And does that budget, you know, do you use that budget to track your performance on a regular basis? Do you understand the regulatory environment of the business that you're in? Because that environment could actually constrain you from scale. There's certain things that you can or cannot do because uh, uh, for scale. I'll give you a quick example. Some of these urban mobility, the bikes, you know, uh, Gokada, Max, and all of that. You, you need about 10 licenses to put a bike on the road in Lagos today. Imagine these guys want to put 10,000 bikes on the road. So you've got to have 10 of these licenses for every single bike. So understand the regulation and understand how regulation may constrain you from, from scaling. Um, do you have a sense of what your key performance indicators to your business are? So that if you don't achieve this thing or if you see this thing, you know that something is good or something is bad with your business. Have those KPIs, not just the financial or revenue KPIs, the other non-qualitative KPIs as well. Do you have a board of advisors? You know, again, it was mentioned here, or directors. How do you relate to them? How do you report to them? How do you account to them? Because they can see the wood from the trees that you see. So answering these questions is really all about, is your business standardized? Is it working not like a good engine running? So that when, you're, when you start to get more transactions, when you start opening branches, it is easy for you to do that because you build your business to be robust from the very, from the very beginning. So the fourth question, and the final one, is around, you know, how can technology help? And, you know, it was a bit of a trick question, because there is no fourth question. Because as you, as you noticed, when I was answering questions one to three, I was talking about technology all the way through. So it's not really about building a business and saying, I've done this, I've done this, and now I'm ready for technology. It cannot be like that. As you build your business, you've got to be thinking about technology. The day you start to have an online presence, the day you start getting transactions, can people, you know, ca can they see me online? Can they transact with me online? Um, the day you start business, do I have a financial accounting reporting system that is, that is, uh, that is, um, that is, that is technology based? It's not, you know, ledger books or whatever it is. Before you start, how do I do my transactions? Even with my bank, is it a mobile banking app? How do I accept transactions? Can I accept cards? Can I accept online payments? All those things are technology based and you must be thinking about them from day one of your business, not trying to add them on. Because when you try and add them on later, it actually gets a lot more, it gets a lot more difficult. I know this sounds daunting, but the truth about it is that there are many, uh, many companies, SMEs like yourself, that have actually, their own role in life is to support SMEs using technology. You've heard about the accounteers of this world that help you basically manage your accounts from day one. They are, they are SMEs, they have a technology bias, and the good thing about them is that many of them are subscription-based. They're cloud-based and they're subscription-based. And it means two things. First of all, you don't have to think about having your own computer infrastructure because all your data, everything is stored in a cloud that is managed by them. Second of all, you don't have to pay, up, pay for them upfront. They're subscription-based and you, it's like a pay-as-you-go. As your business gets bigger, you pay a little bit more, you get a little bit more. And that, you see, that model really helps you to start thinking about technology from day one and also enables you to scale in a way that is affordable and doable for you. So what would also, I mean, how do you get, and many of you are not tech. I know when you talk about tech, people are always scared about technology. But I just want to suggest a few ways in which you can help yourself to stay abreast of what is going on in technology and begin to think through how these technologies can help you run your businesses better, assuming that your business is, is non-tech. There are conferences like this almost every single month where tech entrepreneurs get together and they talk about what they're doing. Even if you're not a tech entrepreneur, go to those conferences. Most of them are free. And I have one of my mentees who, she's a, you know, she's a medical doctor. She was trying to build a tech business around her, her, you know, her, cancer, um, um, her cancer expertise. 
And I would see her at all these tech conferences, say, what are you doing here again? I want to learn. And she started building an app because of all the things that she learned at those tech conferences. So take some time out and go to tech conferences. They're not only for tech people, they're for all of us. Second thing, when you go to those tech conferences, they always have pitching sessions. Wait for those pitch sessions. Hear about what people are doing. Um, because you know, tech people tend to be more um, amenable to scale. Because if they're not talking about scale, the funders are not interested. And when they talk about scale, you really begin to understand somebody that hasn't even started a business is talking about how he can generate $10 million of revenue in year one. That's how they think. And it becomes quite infectious. They think really big. So wait for those pitch sessions, not only to hear about what is happening in the tech world, but also to get inspiration. It's quite infectious about how these people think about, about scale. You can think about starting your business in a co-working space where you can collaborate with people that are in other industries. Many of them are tech businesses. And you begin to just, by osmosis, hear about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and really begin to get into that world of tech. Subscribe to tech journals, tech about, tech point. They're the ones that showcase tech companies and showcase what they're doing. And that's where you begin to know, oh, there's this company that actually does this. They can help me manage my Twitter account. They can help me, uh, they, they, they can help me do my accounting. They can help me do my online payments, accepting payments around different channels. So, they're SMEs like you, they're startups like you, and there's nothing better than startups collaborating and engaging because you understand each other and the, and the challenges that, you, that you're faced with. Um, so making yourself open to ideas and innovation, but always measuring the risk and reward to your business. There's no point you know, being innovative and taking risks that may actually damage your business. You need to be also deliberate and purposeful in the way that you look at innovation. So to conclude, you know, scaling a business requires several things. It requires innovation that can scale, it requires a company that can scale. And it also requires you to bake technology in from the day that you start the company. And that enables you to scale in an orderly fashion and build that big business. Thank you.